happy to affirm that criminal justice systems should value rehabilitation over retribution. Let's start with some definitions. Um, first, rehabilitation is defined as the attitude seeking to reform a criminal, preparing him for reintegration into society. So rehabilitative systems of punishment are going to be focused on smaller jail sentences and more onto reentry programs to rehabilitate someone. Um, retribution seeks to recompense criminal behavior by getting even. It's akin to the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth mentality, where we amp up punishments and sanctions and make punishment uh, more violent and more aggressive because we want to truly get even um, with the offender. The other thing I'm going to define is the word recidivism. Recidivism refers to the rate of how many people go back to jail. So a criminal system that has a 50% recidivism rate means half the people that leave jail are going to come back. So of course, lower recidivisms are uh, recidivism rates are better because they represent criminal justice success and higher recidivism rates mean that nope they didn't learn their lesson. Let's step into the weighing mechanism. The weighing mechanism is that of social health. Um, this means that we do what's best for society. In the context of criminal justice it looks like lowering crime, reducing suffering and violence, keeping families together, all the stuff that we'd be regularly familiar with. This is a no-brainer. However, I want to also offer a prerequisite to social health. You can remember this is pragmatism, which is the idea that we should only pursue things in a way that is useful. In other words, some people say communism is the ideal of social health. Um, everything's perfectly allotted and we never need to work again for the rest of our lives. But we've tried communism a lot, pragmatically, and it hasn't really worked that well. So we should only pursue policies that are successful and produce results instead of just hypothesizing about what we think might be healthy. So let's look at the stuff that has worked. Let's step down into my two contentions. My first argument is that rehabilitation improves social health. Um, for a good contrast between strategies, look to the United States and the country of Norway. The United States in the 1980s started amping up its policies being hard on crime, um, increasing sanctions for small drug offenses, you know, I mean, there's been a million tales, I won't tell them all, but you know, stories of, let's say like a, you know, an, an older father who was selling weed and then he gets put in jail for 50 years. And it's all the attitude that we need to punish criminals. Truly nothing works to save them. So we just need to as hard as we can. Now the recidivism rate in the United States is a whopping 76.6%, meaning that three quarters of all prisoners who leave jail are gonna come back within five years. That means that the criminal justice system is simply not doing its job. Whereas if you contrast with a country like Norway that has a cap on their sentence and focuses on rehabilitation systemically, um, they're, since implementing programs, their uh, recidivism rate has dropped to uh, roughly 20%. So, I mean, they've been far more successful than us. Um, the last thing is the meta-analysis. The University of New Brunswick in 2002 conducted a meta-analysis comprising 442,000 offenders, demonstrating conclusively that harsher sanctions increase recidivism. Where there's plenty of uh, evidence from the National Institute of Justice, as well as the Government Accountability Office, suggesting that actual rehabilitative models decrease recidivism and increase the chances of a successful system. So I think I found something that everyone in this round can agree on. The goal of criminal justice is to give justice to criminals. And whatever side is most closely related to that goal is the side that deserves to win. In other words, this round has a clear value, justice. And with that in mind, I'm going to prove that retribution should be valued more with two main contentions. My first contention is that retribution pursues justice. Now, all definitions of justice boil down to the same basic principle, giving each man what he's due. Justinian in Corpus Juris Civilis writes, justice is a habit whereby a man renders to each one his due with constant and perpetual will. So how is the concept of justice related to retribution? Well, retribution gives each offender his due by making him repay his debt to society. According to English philosopher John Cottingham, the Latin root of the word retribution literally means I pay back. The idea is that making offenders pay back their debt to society with a proportionate punishment gives each offender what he or she is due. It's pretty simple. So my second main point is that rehabilitation is unrelated to justice. Black's Law Dictionary 8th edition defines rehabilitation as the process of seeking to improve a criminal's character and outlook so that he or she can function in society without committing more crimes. This meshes with what my opponent mentioned in his speech. Rehabilitation was created with the goal of reforming character. It focuses on the clinical needs of the offender, potential recidivism, and public safety. However, it does not focus in any meaningful way on what the offender morally deserves for his crime. C.S. Lewis, in his essay, The Humanitarian Theory of Punishment, writes that when we value rehabilitation above retribution, quote, it removes from punishment the concept of desert, the only connecting link between punishment and justice. When we cease to consider what the criminal deserves and consider only what will cure him, we have tacitly removed him from the sphere of justice altogether. So 
So please understand, I'm not trying to say that rehabilitation is always bad or that we shouldn't have it all together. I think that it's wonderful, but is it directly related to justice, the core mission of the criminal justice system? Absolutely not. Retribution, on the other hand, directly pursues justice by making offenders pay back their debt to society. So when it comes to criminal justice, retribution is the cake and rehabilitation is the icing. I'll use these principles to disprove my opponent's case in later speeches, but for now, I pass the mic. So my opponent hasn't all contested the fact that uh, rehabilitation is actually more useful. And, and the most important part is that she hasn't addressed the central weighing mechanism. My opponent's going to talk to you in vague terms about justice for the rest of this round. Just remember what actually matters, and that's results. So on the concession of the weighing mechanism, she may respond to that later. I just want to go down the contention that she's offered. So first, on the value of justice, my response is justice limited. Justice only has utility up to the point that it's actually benefiting society. There's many different interpretations of justice, not just Emily's. So if you're going to endorse a version of justice, it might as well be one that's actually going to be doing pragmatic good for society. Don't support Emily's opinion, her abstract conception of justice that's actually increasing crime rates, which means increasing suffering and violence. It means tearing apart families. It means ensuring that society doesn't see the health that it so desperately needs. That's not a conception of justice that we want to pursue. And sure, it sounds cute and neat to say, well, we just give them what they're due and everything turns out swell. I would ask you to look to countries like Norway that are knocking our socks off with criminal justice. They are far more successful on their society societies are a better place to live. So don't buy this conception of justice that's purely hypothetical. Second, under contention, I have two responses. The first is tangible evil versus hypothetical evil. Crime is an actual evil. Suffering is an actual evil. Um, violence to the innocent, that's an actual evil people can experience. What Emily's saying is, no, 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 none of that stuff matters. We just want to be able to feel emotionally like we've been just, and that's the real goal. I'd ask you to choose the actual scale of impact, which is the real evil people experience, as far more important than simply the emotion of feeling even after we punish someone. Um, my second response is tax excuse me, taxpayers. Um, think about this, that for every dollar we spend on retribution, we save about four on rehabilitation because fewer people are coming back into the system. Think about the impact that this would have to taxpayers who are funding the criminal justice system right now, so we would have to pay way less. So it's a smaller burden on society. My third response you can add in is betrays the defenseless. What's most critical is, is that the burden of high recidivism is not just borne by taxpayers or just by some philosophers who philosophically disagree with it. Rather, it's borne by the innocent people that will face higher crime rates as a result of higher recidivism. Recidivism means actual suffering, not hypothetical suffering. It means actual violence, not hypothetical violence. So you can listen to the conceptual version of justice my opponent has given you, or you can choose to improve social health, um, ensure that violence goes down, the suffering of innocent people goes down, and crime rates are lowered. I think your decision is easy. Okay, so I'm basically going to take my analysis, address both cases simultaneously with two main points of analysis. The first is going to be what the core purpose of the criminal justice system is. So first and foremost, we have to look at the resolution. It is asking what the criminal justice systems should value. It's asking it to look at two things, things which aren't mutually exclusive, and ask which one is more essential and more valuable. So this needs to be brought up because my opponent seems to be painting this bleak picture that I want to get rid of programs which help stop recidivism and I'm thinking pie in the sky and I don't want good things to happen. And that's just kind of funny because if you recall in my conclusion, I literally say I don't want to get rid of rehabilitation. I just don't think it's the indispensable core of the system. It's important to choose the indispensable core of the system over something that provides benefits in an empirical sense because that's what we're looking for, right? We're supposed to look for the most indispensable and valuable thing. Now, my opponent doesn't seem to have any qualms with the fact that justice is what criminal justice is all about. Now, he did say that this is my opinion of justice and how it should work. This is not my opinion. This is actually people like Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. This is Aristotle. This is Justinian. And William Blackstone, in his fourth commentary on the laws of England, Chapter 2, page 27, paragraph 3 says, the only justifiable reason to punish someone is if, and I quote, they abuse that free will which God has given man. So this isn't just my arbitrary opinion. This is the distilled basic idea behind criminal justice in the first place. And that's why the negative outlook is the only outlook that supports the core purpose of the criminal justice system. I'm not going all or nothing. I don't want to get rid of what Pro is preaching for. I think rehabilitation is super useful, but it doesn't ever answer the question, what does the criminal deserve? And that's what motivates everything from arrest, sentencing, and beyond. 
So briefly, I want to get into the matter of dessert. You know, that question, what does the criminal deserve? We seem to be on the same page about rehabilitation. That's great. It's programs and it helps people and it gets rid of recidivism and it's super, super useful. That's good. Um, so it doesn't really have anything to do with what the criminal deserves. It's just kind of a clinical approach. Now, in contrast, retribution is fair. My opponent is painting this false equivocation between cruelty and retribution, like it's some sort of emotional way of getting even. That's actually not in line with the education on the subject at all. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy lists three main parts of retributive justice. First, that it has to be deserved and proportional to the crime. Second, the inherent good of that punishment. And third, that if there is ever any punishment that is not proportional and is not deserved, that's not retributive justice. So what my opponent has done in an attempt to attack my case is use a fallacy, false equivocation, and that just can't stand. Quick question for you. Do you think that we should punish people proportionally? That's what justice means? I think that's what retribution does, and yes, I think that's what justice means. Okay, so what's the proportional punishment for hitting someone in the ribs with a baseball bat? Well, I'm not a judge, and unfortunately, I didn't get to go to law school like I wanted to, so I can't give you an educated opinion on that. So you have no position on what a, a proportional punishment would be for assault? It's, uh, um, anyway, uh, it's not I don't have an opinion. I'm just not educated enough to tell you something in that specific instance that's how law and order and criminal justice works. I'm just trying to not say something that I don't want to talk about. Okay, that's fair. All right, let's group the arguments about the purpose of the criminal justice system as well as proportionality. I'm going to have two responses. My first response is that you concede the weighing mechanism. You're not answering pragmatism. You're simply inserting that justice is the goal without answering my analysis about how we have to pragmatically achieve justice. My second response is that social benefit supersedes. She also concedes the analysis that we only pursue justice insofar as it actually helps society. For example, technically right now, I'm sure Emily and I, and as everyone else watching, has probably jaywalked a time or two in their life. But it wouldn't be productive to society for policemen to leave their posts, hunt down everyone who's jaywalked and give it's a productive way to enforce the law or to be quote unquote proportional. So it's not a helpful way. We must always analyze justice with the limitation of social benefit. The third thing is remember the rhetoric. Emily is actually conceding that she is okay with increasing rates of crime. We all know what crime does. Crime increases things like rape. Crime increases things like lost fathers. It increases things like destroyed homes. It increases things like aggression and violence. These aren't just conceptions. These are tangible impacts. And by voting for a side that would tangibly increase recidivism, that's exactly what you're doing. Um, the fourth response is tangible standard. Now, it's actually interesting. I, I, she said we should always be punishing people proportionally, but Emily doesn't even know what that means. This is why you should actually choose recidivism, because it's a more tangible bright line. In other words, it gives governments a standard to work off of. We can say if the government's being good or not with its policies by measuring how successful its systems are. This is so much better than the vague philosophical conception of justice that the government's right as long as it just kind of gives people what they're due. Let's give a standard that actually focuses on government policy and makes them accountable for their own failings. All right, second, she says, I don't want to get rid. My first is welcome to the, my first response is welcome to the resolution. You have to get rid of it. If you're not, not entirely, absolutely, we agree that there's some moments of overlap where you can have both. But the resolution is asking for your choice. So by you saying, of course, we should be choosing retribution, it's better. But we should never in any way limit or reduce rehabilitation. That makes no sense. The resolution exists because there is a choice and you must choose between the two. Um, the third thing she talks about on the opinion level is says, well, it's not my opinion, it's also Stanford's opinion. My first response is, so what? Um, my second response is multiple conceptions. My argument wasn't to say that you are bad at opinions, Emily, and therefore your opinion of justice is bad. That wasn't at all. My point was to say there are multiple conceptions of justice. Take, for example, Plato's uh, conception of harmonious function, where he believes that the best conception of justice is one where society is all working together and things are peaceful. There's different conceptions of it. That's not the point. The point is to emphasize what conceptions of justice are really, truly beneficial. The conceptions of justice that do positive good in society and don't don't leave people with broken homes, with higher rates of violence, with higher rates of rape, with more just destroyed fragments in society. Emily isn't answering the analysis on pragmatism, and she's also not answering the analysis on social health. Always do what's good for society, not what's good for a couple of brainiac philosophers in a jar. Okie dokie, so let's get back to business. Let's remember that first main issue, the core purpose of the criminal justice system, because that's what this is all about. So my opponent said something super duper interesting. He said, 
that uh, welcome to the resolution that uh, we have to pick one or the other. So first of all, I think that's curious because that's not what you said to me when we were picking out this resolution. The second thing is that these two things work in conjunction in the criminal justice system all the time. It's what they do. So I don't have to get rid of rehabilitation or even reduce it to say that one is more important than the other. They have different functions. Rehabilitation is more clinical, whereas retribution is directly related to the indispensable core of the system, the mission which motivates, like gas moves a car, all the way through the process, right? Why do we arrest people? Why do we sentence people? Why do we send them to jail? We do it because someone made an offense and they need to pay back their debt to society, which FYI is how my side actually helps society by making sure that society has its debt repaid by the offender. Simple as that. Uh, my opponent said that I agreed to his weighing mechanism. Um, no, absolutely not. See, the problem with his weighing mechanism is that it weighs the wrong thing. We're supposed to weigh the core purpose of the criminal justice system, right? So rehabilitation weighs the clinical needs of the offender, uh, the safety of society. I love those things, that they have nothing to do with the criminal justice system. They're not what motivates the process and they're not indispensable to that process. So quite frankly, his weighing mechanism is just like two ships passing in the night. He's missing the mark altogether. In contrast, retribution doesn't miss that mark. He again made that false equivocation. He described it as a vague feeling of getting even. And I think he's trying to reference his cross-ex where I wasn't going to give him an exact answer on case law because I don't want to say that which I don't know because I didn't go to law school. But that's the thing. This is a values resolution I would know because it was in my old debate league and I wrote a 40 plus page source book on it. And so in a values resolution, the idea is to look at the thing which is indispensable and look at a guiding principle. And that's what we're doing. So let's get back to that second main issue, the question of dessert. It's really great. My opponent and I are on the same page. Nothing in his side literally has anything to do with giving the, giving the offender what they deserve. He has this focus on doing good for society and I applaud him. I'm glad that he cares, but it has nothing to do with the resolution. Doing good for society is something I would love to see in the criminal justice system, but it's quite frankly irrelevant to the question. We're supposed to give justice to criminals. That's why we have a criminal justice system. So everything he's bringing up is just kind of a non sequitur. He doesn't actually support the resolution at all. And if he can't do that, then he can't win. Okay, um, my first argument is about value theory. I really hate to go to this level. Um, the ace of point you can write down is contradiction. Why is that saying that rehabilitation is inferior if she doesn't in any, in any way want to reduce it? Why would we ever say that one thing is superior if we're in no way gonna let our actions actually reflect our words? Actions speak louder than words. So Emily actually does have to choose. Uh, my second response is purple is better than seven. That resolution doesn't make any sense because you never have to choose between purple and seven. If my opponent's analysis is true and that you don't actually have to reduce rehabilitation at all to vote negative, that you can truly believe one is superior and should be valued above, which by the way is an action and should never reduce it in any way, then you're saying you don't have to choose between the two, which we obviously do. We wouldn't rehabilitate someone and then keep them in prison for 30 years to serve out a sentence. Norway doesn't take its criminals, give them the death penalty, and then send them back out into society. There are clear distinctions and clear moments of clash. The third thing is our Facebook messages, you actually said, yes, let's focus on the clash and the debate, but then you're ignoring the clash by conceding and saying, actually, I don't even want to reduce re rehabilitation at all. So again, verbal contradiction here. I don't think we need to get into our personal messages, but you said that we should focus on the clash. So I think that's what we should do. And I don't think that's what you've done properly. Um, the second thing she talks about is the core purpose of the criminal justice system. Okay. My first response is Emily's opinion. Um, Emily's opinion of the criminal justice system is that it should focus on this vague, abstract version of justice that does no good for society and actual practical harm. I think that's silly to assume that there's only one purpose of the criminal justice system when the per criminal justice system in practice responds to crime. There's a lot of different purposes we can weigh and talk about which are more important, which begs the question, which are superior? See, Emily's just coming back and saying verbally, well, the purpose is this, the purpose is this, but she's not actually shown why that is a superior purpose. I've already shown you why pragmatism through social health is the best kind of purpose, because it reduces the tangible impacts to society. It reduces real world crime, and it makes people's lives significantly better. It reduces the effect on the taxpayer. If you'll extend um, all four of my responses to her argument on purpose, you'll also see that it improves government accountability, because now there is an exact standard by which we can weigh government action, and see if they've been successful or just a failure. Okay. Again, let's get back to the issues. The 
first, of course, would speak to our purpose of the criminal justice system. So again, my opponent is going with this really pragmatic approach, but it's quite frankly unrelated, right? So his whole idea is, again, that I have to choose one or the other. He said he was going to get into values theory. Well, that's fun because values is what I do. I'm the LD coach. So let's talk about values theory. Not all values resolutions are what we call mutually exclusive or absolute. And as you look at it, this is not one of them. See, a therapy program for prisoners or college education for prisoners, things which were due to recidivism, a form of rehabilitation, these things don't compromise your ability to give them the sentence that they deserve. They don't necessarily conflict. In fact, they really don't conflict at all because they have two entirely different purposes. So to say that I have to choose one or the other is just out of touch with reality, which quite frankly is ironic for a case that runs on pragmatism. So again, let's talk about that core purpose of the criminal justice system. What is the real indispensable thing here? Providing clinical needs for the offender in order to try and reduce recidivism, a good goal, I think, or actually providing justice at all. It's in the name. I think we know the answer here. But while we're at it, my opponent said something really interesting. He said that rehabilitation would not leave someone to rot in jail far past their original sentence. I don't know if he's familiar with the name James Ward, but he should be. In 2005, the Labor Home Secretary in the UK passed a law called IPC sentencing. It's indeterminate sentencing, which according to the University of Chicago Law Review is a hallmark of rehabilitative policy. And a man named James Ward, who was only supposed to spend 10 months in jail for a minor arson charge because of rehabilitative, rehabilitative sentencing, he spent over a decade of his life in jail because of rehabilitation. That's insane. Why? Because they made him wait and rot without atonement until the bureaucrats in the state decided to say, oh, you're rehabilitated now. And that's the core of the problem with rehabilitation, that it takes away moral agency, that it takes away the heart of the criminal justice system, and most importantly, it takes away the chance at atonement. My opponent might try to sell you on pragmatism, but don't forget that principles matter. Principles matter because they define our humanity, they define right and wrong, and they define the core mission of what we do here. So I'm gonna really bring up that question of deserve. What the criminal deserve? I would consider this at this point a dropped point. My opponent doesn't really want to address what the criminal deserves because it's not convenient to him. And so honestly, none of his arguments have tried to say that retribution isn't what the criminal deserves and that it doesn't focus on equal punishment. He only wants to talk about pragmatism and that's a problem because remember, why do we arrest people? Why do we sentence them? Why do we send them to jail? Because of what the offender did, what they deserve and paying back that debt to society. Criminal justice is to give justice to criminals. No one, if they could choose the life they live, would ever choose the kind of justice Emily's asking for. Um, no one who has to be reintegrated into society at any age, in any demographic, at any point throughout history is going to beg for higher crime rates. No one is ever going to ask for more families to be ripped apart, for dads to be pulled out of homes. No one's ever going to ask for the philosophical pleasure that Emily is asking you to vote for. So when you come back to this round, remember the scale of the impact. It's always going to be massive on the side of the pro. Emily has never contested data, links between recidivism and rehabilitation slash retribution, and has never conceded that it has never uh, addressed that pragmatism is a superior way to make policy. Um, let's start with the issue of it being unrelated. My response is directly related. Um, the criminal justice system responds to crime. So there's different ways to respond. We should analyze which ones are better. I mean, imagine saying, oh, reducing crime and making sure that criminals don't reoffend. That has nothing to do with the criminal justice system. Yeah, it absolutely does. Who else is going to do it? Uh, the, the Department of Homeland Security? Certainly not. Um, second, she says these aren't mutually exclusive. Okay, back to value theory. Two responses. First is Venn diagram. Um, I'm not saying that there's perfect mutual exclusivity and you can never have overlap. This is true. For example, we might say it's better to spend time with your family than go to work. You can have an example where you have a bring your family to work day, where you have both of those things at the same time. But at 9 a.m. most mornings, you're going to have to make a choice as to whether or not you go to work or spend time with your family. In other words, there's a Venn diagram, areas of overlap, and areas of conflict. Again, Emily actually said in the Facebook messages she wanted to focus on Clash, which isn't as interesting as the fact that value resolutions demand it. Um, you can't say purple is better than seven because there's no Clash. There's no choice 
choice. There's no way to opt between those two or value one above the other. Yet Emily is actually getting out of all of the arguments on recidivism by saying, oh, by the way, I like it and we're going to do nothing to it. This makes no sense. Why would you spend your case talking about why retribution is better if you're never going to enact that in policy and reduce rehabilitation? On um, the second response is empirics. Norway is different from the United States. Um, there are actual practical differences before and analogical links, like the fact that you can't rehabilitate someone and kill them at the same time with the death penalty. You can't um, rehabilitate someone out of a drug offense and keep them in a mandatory minimum sentence for four decades. Like there are practical, obvious differences, points of choice that we must analyze. Focusing on overlap does nothing. It doesn't tell us which is better. It doesn't tell us which should be chosen. It just says sometimes we don't have to choose. Um, lastly, she says clinical needs. I just want to say this is not about the clinical needs of the offender. This is about the clinical needs of society. We're talking about reducing crime and making life better for everyone. Um, second, she talks about James Ward. I mean, this is the probably the weakest argument against rehabilitation. That there was a computer glitch and he stayed in for too long. Someone made a mistake. Retribution has the longer sentence. So if you don't like people rotting in jail, why would you ask the judges to vote for it? Lastly, she talks about principles and what people deserve. I come back to pragmatism. Your principles are pointless if they raise crime. Your principles are pointless if they increase violence, broken homes, and suffering within society. That's why I'd ask you to vote for rehab. Okay, so let's look at the two voting issues for this round. First, values. Let's get to that issue of clash, right? Let's get into some LD theory. So we are, from my perspective, looking at how these things clash. We look at the ultimate goal, which both sides should strive to achieve, essentially the version of the round. And then I am looking at how both of our sides clash in terms of trying to achieve that goal. So it's quite frankly, not at all in line with LV theory to say that I'm ignoring clash. I can't help it that pro side doesn't actually achieve the core of criminal justice. That's not my problem. The fact is, these two things clash over the same common goal, which is how LV works. So let's talk about that core mission statement for a minute, right? So my opponent has no qualms with the fact that retribution is about equivalent deserved punishment, right? And he keeps saying that retribution causes all these things and all these problems, but he's failed to create a causal link as to how punishing people the exact amount of time they deserve and no more actually raises crime rates. He has called things retribution, but he has failed to show how they are retribution. So the reason I haven't gone into the specifics on his empirics is because his empirics, quite frankly, failed to establish that causal link. And that furthermore, in terms of the value clash, how much retro rehabilitation improves society, that's not the point. That's not the indispensable core of the criminal justice system, right? And again, he didn't really address the point that we can have programs like therapy and college education, which are the core of the rehabilitative programs, and we don't have to change the actual punishment. And that quite frankly gets down to the fact that rehabilitation isn't really a punishment at all. And that's why the fact is that although they clash over this common goal, right, they don't actually have to be mutually exclusive. So you can preserve that clash and it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. So the final point I want to get into is the voting issue of fallacies, right? So this fallacy that my opponent has committed again and again is the false equivocation between all these horrible things and retribution, right? So quite frankly, retribution is the idea that you should have equivalent deserved punishment. But time and time again, he says it's an eye for an eye, it's a tooth for a tooth. I've actually presented sources to back me up on my warrant about why retribution is not about long prison sentences. The fact of the matter is things like the war on drugs, the war on getting tough on crime, all of those things according to Cato Institute are actually a political agenda against specific groups like minorities and liberals. So quite frankly, again, there's no causal link here. So my opponent is trying to say that retribution is all these bad things, but he ignores the fact that it actually fulfills the mandate of the criminal justice system. It has that essential link. So at the end of the day, when you ask who you should vote for, ask the simple question, which side fulfills the core mission of the criminal justice system? Which side gives justice to criminals? I think the answer is clear. Question, do we ever have to choose between retribution and rehabilitation? I would say that um, statistically, it's negligible the times that you do. And so the majority of cases being such, really, as far as our round is concerned, they have two totally different goals. You can have rehabilitative programs and still give people the punishment they deserve because rehabilitation is not a punishment. Okay. 
Um, so to concede that there's never an instance where we need to choose would deny the ability to have this value debate. Purple is better than seven. Never have to choose between those two things. Triangle is better than blue. We never have to choose in between those two things. Freedom is better than democracy. Well, those two are inseparable. We can't choose. Emily has basically said that the resolution is not debatable, which is silly because she spent a lot of time debating it and saying that retribution is better. Um, so the first thing is, is that the overlap is unnecessary. There are areas of overlap, but look at the differences between systems like Norway and the US. Clearly we have differences. You can't rehabilitate someone and keep them in prison for a mandatory minimum, can you? There are moments where we have to choose which choice is better. Um, my chief argument is real world harm. Emily has said over and over, give criminals what they deserve, but she can't even tell you what a proportional punishment is. We don't know what that looks like a lot of time, and it doesn't even keep the government accountable. Instead, focus on the real world crime rates. We've seen from the University of New Brunswick that retributive sentences actually increase recidivism. We've also seen um, from the analysis I presented in my first speech and also examples of Norway that rehabilitation decreases it. When you have a choice between the emotional satisfaction of sounding just or just the opinion about what criminal justice should do, always emphasize the opinion that provides the real world benefit, lower suffering, and improve society. Thank you.